Until the 1990s, Mongolia received large payments from the Soviet Union for permitting 150,000 Soviet troops to be stationed on the border with China. These funds were used in part to support an emergency fodder fund for Mongolian animals. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the troops are gone and so is the extra animal feed. The rapid withdrawal of Soviet influence has had far-reaching consequences for the infrastructure of Mongolia. 30,000 people once lived in Zumbayan. Now there are only 5,000 residents and the town is falling into disrepair. And as socialist infrastructure decayed, it was not only the cities that dried up. In the Gobi Desert, many of the wells where herders water their livestock have broken down. Since most domestic animals require daily water to survive, only pasture near a well can be grazed. As wells fall into disrepair, large tracts of land are out of reach for the herders and their animals. Most of the remaining wells work only with human labor, forcing the herders of the Gobi to spend hours each day drawing water for their herds. This added time at the well further limits how far from the water source the herders can graze their animals. Some of the government uh, international development projects, the prime focus of their activities is rehabilitating abandoned mechanical wells or putting in new wells. Now it's rehabilitating these wells, you're allowing people to come back. And um, the wells in itself do not pose a problem for the, for the Hulan, but what might happen is that you open up areas which act as retreat areas for the Hulan at the moment for people to come in. People are much more mobile now because they have um, access to jeeps. And then the, the distribution of firearms has probably increased. There's no control. And what we see throughout the, the whole distribution range is there's, there's poaching going on. Petra's study would focus on the behavior and range of the Hulan. Using GPS collars, she planned to track several animals by satellite as they moved across the landscape. Dennis would study the Hulan habitat and then correlate it with Petra's distribution data. Collaring of the Hulan was done in July 2005. Seven animals from three different sites throughout the study area were tranquilized and collared by Petra's team. The collars, which will remain for 19 months, upload the Hulan's locations to a satellite. Almost immediately, the researchers were amazed by the data coming in. People think that that's a local population, this is a local population, that probably is all one, one, one big population. Dennis collected data on the type and amount of vegetation and water on the landscape. When the Hulan locations are overlaid on the vegetation data, the researchers could start to answer questions about the Hulan's use of the habitat. But studying the Gobi is challenging, since the habitat is changing constantly in response to erratic Rainfall moisture events. Rainfall when it occurs throughout the Gobi is usually not region-wide or even Gobi-wide. Usually it occurs in patches. Some people would call this a non-equilibrium environment. Wildlife seek them out. Usually they're ahead of the herders, unless the herders just happen to be here, in finding these areas. The ecosystem in areas with recent rain behaves very differently than the dormant dry areas around it. Plants grow rapidly as they try to complete their life cycle before the moisture is gone. The result is that the total amount of forage or biomass is greatly increased. This biomass is attractive to the Hulan. Community data, what we see is that they don't really select for a certain plant community. Um, and that's quite, quite different from what the reintroduced Przewalski horse does, because they really key in on the most productive habitat. Those stay in the steeper step or along the, the kind of the, the oasis, the riverine vegetation. But the Hulan, they use the whole area. There's no preference or avoidance of certain habitat types. And I really think what's going on is they, they track these, 
these high productivity spots and they, they just go where there's most biomass. How the Hulan can predict where a green up will occur is a mystery. Often, they travel 30 or 40 kilometers over rough terrain to reach a site that recently had rain. As they arrive, invigorated desert plants like allium or wild onion are turning green. The study quickly shows that the Hulan are very sensitive to fragmentation of their habitat. Fences and railway tracks constitute major barriers. The effect of the railroad from Ulaanbaatar to Beijing can be clearly seen as Hulan move north along it, unable to cross and therefore blocked from the green area on the far side. But what about the herders? Do they influence wildlife distribution with livestock grazing? Collaborating with Dr. Douglas Johnson at Oregon State University, Dennis deploys a second set of GPS units, this time to monitor the movements of the herders and their domestic livestock. So this unit was developed so that we could track where herders were going in Mongolia where their flocks were grazing, how much time they were spending in various locations. Then we have uh, this, is, this is the GPS unit. The magnet isn't necessary, but it is a way to keep it on. At night, just hang it up. You know, in the morning, anybody does takes the livestock out and take it along. I'll come back at the end of September mm -hmm. and pick up the GPS unit. <laughs> Getting the units deployed is difficult enough, but finding them several months later proves to be even more challenging. Like the Hulan, the herders are always moving in search of the best pasture, and to retrace their path can require some detective work. At Oregon State University, Doug downloads the data from the herder units and begins integrating it with the Hulan positions. Where Hulan can quickly change pastures and cover large distances in a very short time, herders are much more restricted to the location of wells and open water. A herder normally does not venture much farther than seven kilometers from a water point and returns to his gear each night. If the pasture is depleted, he moves his gear and the livestock to a new grazing point, a semi-nomadic movement pattern. Hulan do not need to return each night to the same location and therefore can use the landscape in a truly nomadic fashion. I mean, they have to have this, this flexibility because water points come and disappear, pasture comes and disappear. And, and, and it's, it's also with the protected area as well. You put in this protected area because at that point it looks like a very good habitat and then for the next couple of years you have a drought and there's nothing to feed on, they have to go. But in Mongolia we don't even know what the, what the social system is. I mean, are they, they don't seem to live in, in harems like the, the Tachi do, but they also don't seem really territorial, so that there's basic research needed on these questions. The presence of other wild species, such as the gazelle, only deepens the complexity. These animals have a presence in the Gobi with their own habitat and security needs. For these reasons, the gazelle and hulan will congregate into large herds. They are highly mobile and, when threatened, can reach speeds up to 50 kilometers per hour. 